Okay, this you need to know because in, in uh, gamma cameras and PET cameras, there are lots of uh, resolution degrading effects that are hard to compensate. And as a result of that, our final images have relatively poor resolution, in particular compared to other imaging modalities like uh, ultrasound, MR, CT, they all have much better resolution than uh, nuclear medicine imaging. So we need to know about that resolution and about the sources of partial volume problems. All right. Um, so here again, the same slide, and we need to keep that in mind because the, the geometry and the, the way we determine these lines, either by collimation, uh, by mechanical collimation or by electric collimation, uh, are creating uh, this are contributing to this resolution degrading effects. So first, the collimator. And actually, this collimator that we need in single photon emission is a pain because all it does is absorbing photons. So ideally, you would want to use a lens as in photography. If you don't have a lens, you will have uniform illumination of your detector, and you would get a lot of photons, but no image. Same here. If we do away with the collimator, we have the same problem. So of course, we would prefer to use a lens because with the lens, we take all these photons that hit the lens, they're all used to, to make an image. So that's very good uh, for the noise characteristics. But making lenses to uh, focus photons with 100 uh, kilo electron volt or more is very difficult. I've been told they actually exist but there are huge structures that you don't want to rotate around the patient. So in practice, we don't have lenses. Um, and that's why we use the, the, the second best thing then, which is a collimator. But again, it's, it's very sad because most of the photons are actually absorbed by the collimator and we would have preferred to use them for imaging. PET doesn't have that problem and that gives PET a significant advantage over single photon uh, tomography. So if you can, if you have to make collimators, you can just as well try to turn it into an art and have a bit of fun with it. Um, so the, the most popular collimator is the parallel hole collimator. There are several reasons for that. Um, first, manufacturing parallel hole collimators is difficult, but it's easier than manufacturing most of the other ones. More importantly, a gamma camera is human sized. So it, the crystal is like half a meter wide, and that's about the size of, of or the widest size of our thorax or abdomen. So a human body nicely fits uh, the size of a, of a gamma camera and therefore a parallel projection of the human body onto the detector makes good use of that detector. And also it is intuitive. So a parallel projection is easy to understand and uh, gamma cameras are often used for 2D imaging uh, instead of tomography and interpreting 2D parallel projections is relatively easy. But if you would do a brain spec, then the human head is significantly smaller than this 50 by 40 centimeters. So then we use a lot of crystal to make an image of a small object, implying that most of that crystal is actually not seeing any photons at all, which is a shame. So for that, you could use instead a fan beam collimator. So now we put the head close to the detector, but the collimator is focused. So now some parts of the crystal that didn't get to see anything here will start seeing activity. So we use more crystal detector. If for the rest we design a collimator in an optimal way, we should have better uh, signal for the same resolution or otherwise better resolution for the same signal because we acquire more voltage from the same object. So then you can say, well, 50 centimeter is large compared to the human head, but so is 40 centimeter in the other direction. So we can focus in both directions. Then we get a cold beam collimator. But they are much less popular. And I think um, for several reasons. Uh, one is, I think, positioning. So it's for the technologist, is already slightly harder to position a fan beam, but it's much harder to do a good positioning for a cold beam. So if you would do cold beam spec, the patient that is here, but is poor, poorly positioned, you would get truncation artifacts in your reconstruction, and you may have to do the scan again. Also, interpreting. Cone beam projections, the, the, the planar projections of cone beam are, are much more difficult to interpret because they create significant deformations. And the, the, the image made by a distribution 
depends on the distance of the distribution or depends heavily of the distance of the distribution to the detector, which complicates interpreting the image. Now, if you like the Combin uh, geometry, you can actually have mathematically the same thing in a very simple way. You just take a bunch of lead and you drill a small hole in it. Then you also have a collimator, um, which has already been invented by Leonardo da Vinci, which he, he called it camera obscura. And actually you can use it for imaging. So it, it focuses uh, all the lines, obviously, because to see something, the photon needs to go through that little hole. So mathematically, the situation is the same as in the cone beam uh, geometry. The only difference is that here, the object is at the other side of the focus. So the nice thing about Pino is that it's really very easy to make. And the, the, it's easy to control the resolution and the sensitivity that's just determined by the size of that hole. In addition, it gets a very strong magnification. So if you put a small object here, then you can see that these lines will create a very strong magnification of that object to the crystal. And that magnification has uh, two advantages. One is that you actually use a large part of your crystal to look at a small object, which should be good for the sensitivity. And second, if you magnify something, then the four millimeter intrinsic resolution becomes less damaging. If I first magnify by a factor of 10, the effect of four millimeter resolution is actually only 0.4 on my true scale. So the more I magnify, the less I'm hindered by the intrinsic resolution. And that is why this pinhole is very popular for small animal imaging. So it's about the best you can do if you want to image a mouse with a, with a gamma camera, with a large gamma camera, is to magnify the mouse uh, and to put the mouse very close to the, the detector, uh, to the collimator, because the sensitivity, of course, decreases with the square uh, of the distance to that little hole. Pinol is also used to do some planar imaging in thyroid uh, for the same reason. The, the thyroid is relatively small, and so you get a, a thyroid image which is magnified, so you get better resolution, and you do that with reasonable sensitivity. But again, that image is severely deformed, so it's hard to interpret. I think in principle, well, it, it is definitely possible to do pinhole spec and to reconstruct from it. In clinical imaging, that's never done. I'm not exactly sure why. I think partly for historic reasons, because pinhole reconstruction is more difficult. I think also for, to some extent, for safety reasons, you don't want to be hit by a pinhole collimator, but I guess that that could be uh, avoided. Okay, so one important thing to know about uh, resolution in uh, single photon imaging is that the collimator has a big effect on the resolution and that the resolution decreases linearly uh, uh, with the distance or that the width of the point spread function increases linearly with the distance. And that's illustrated here. So the idea of the collimator is obviously to just acquire uh, photons that uh, travel along perpendicular lines. But of course, the collimator needs to have a finite size. And that means that also slightly obliquely traveling photons can enter. And now this geometry almost, is almost the same independent of the distance of the point source. So I can always draw the same triangle, which uh, gives the solid angle in which photons can be accepted. So if I move this source away from the camera, then this, this geometry stays the same, and the point source will uh, irradiate the larger part of the detector. So the number of photons will be about the same, but they will be spread uh, over a much larger distance. Now, of course, we, we don't like big blobs. We want the resolution. And we can achieve that in two ways, which are equivalent. We can make the septa longer, or we can make the distance between the septa smaller. So uh, geometrically, that's the same thing. We change the ratio of the length of the septa to the uh, hole size. Now, if we do that, then as illustrated here, we get indeed better resolution, or saying it otherwise, for a larger distance, we get the same resolution. But now, of course, photons that would have been measured here will be absorbed here. And that means that we will measure fewer photons. So we clearly have to go for a compromise. 
either we acquire fewer photons, but then we can have better resolution, or we acquire more photons, but then we have worse resolution. And that is the reason why in uh, spect imaging, many of the gamma cameras come with different sets of collimators, and these are options when you buy a camera and depends on what kind of uh, indications you will scan. So you can have longer septa for better resolution. You can have thicker septa to better stop photons. You can have shorter septa, so short septa, then the collimator will be called um, high sensitivity collimator, but it can also be called low resolution collimator, of course, and the other way around. Now we can quantify that, but to, to do these kind of calculations, it's very useful to uh, remember this simple rule. So the question is, suppose I put a point source here, just in front of the detector. So this, this line here is orthogonal to the detector surface, this is the detector. And the size of the detector is D by T. The distance is R and the question is, of all the photons emitted here, which fraction will be measured by that detector? And the answer you can produce like this. So consider a very big sphere and its radius is R, meaning that the detector is touching the sphere. And because the detector is very small, we can ignore the fact that it actually is flat while the surface of the sphere is not exactly flat, but the effects will be small for a small detector. So D is much smaller than R. Therefore, with good approximation, this detector simply covers a part of the surface of the sphere. And now we know that the photons are emitted uniformly in all directions. So that means that statistically, or on the average, every point in the sphere will see the same amount of photons. And therefore, the fraction that will reach that detector is simply the ratio of this area, which is d squared, divided by the total area of the sphere, which is 4 pi r squared. OK. <coughs> and so yeah, with r1, this would be the solid angle. So the maximum solid angle is 4 pi. And d squared divided by r squared is a solid angle associated with this little detector. If the detector would be much larger, we would have to take into account the curvature and you would have to draw a cone from the point source to the detector and calculate the intersection area of that cone with the surface of the sphere. All right. So with this trick, we can do some uh, crude quantitative analysis of what a collimator should see depending on the distance between the or the yeah, the distance between the septa and the height of the septa. And once we have that expression, you could sophisticate it by correcting for the thickness of the septa and all that, but I haven't done that yet. So suppose the point source is here, and then we can compute for every distance r, how much shade this septum will produce on the detector. So photons that travel in this yellow, uh, triangle will actually reach the detector and the ones here will not reach the detector so there is a shadow here and that shadow you can easily check that this shadow is proportional to uh, r uh, times t divided by h so with a little bit of calculation you will find that the psf the, the point spread function associated with this uh, simplistic uh, approximations is just a triangle so in, in the middle, the, the crystal is completely covered between the septa, so that is the maximum sensitivity. And then it linearly decreases because this S linearly increases with the distance until here. And this point R, this point R here um, is uh, given by um, R divided by H times T. All right, and then um, we can integrate this over the surface of the uh, collimator. Now, there are several ways to do that. Um, one way is to just ignore the shape of these holes and just assume that the whole thing is radially symmetrical. Then you can very easily integrate this over R and theta. It would be constant over theta. And you have simple integral over R. And then you will end up with this sensitivity. Or you could say the holes are little squares. So all that is explained in detail in the course. If you assume the holes are little square, 
then you can integrate over x and independently over y. And the result will be almost the same, except that this 12 is replaced by four times pi, so almost the same thing. In real life, the, the holes are typically hexagonals. And doing it exactly for hexagonals is possible too, but it's very boring and the result will be very similar to this. So but the cool thing about this is to see that h is not there. So that means if I move this point source up and down, the total amount of counts seen by the crystal or by the, yeah, by the detector will stay the same. Um, so the reason why a gamma camera should be very close to the patient is not to get good sensitivity because that has no effect. The reason that we put it close is that we then have good resolution, okay? Now, if you have a collimator, so typical sizes would be A around one millimeter and T two centimeters. So that would be one over 20 here, squared is one over 400. And with that 12 here, it's about one in 5,000. It depends on the collimator. Uh, high, resol high resolution collimators will see fewer photons, high sensitivity collimators will see a bit more. So but the order of magnitude is correct if you look. Uh, put something in front of a gamma camera, then one in uh, 5,000 or one in 7,000 of the photons emitted in any direction will be seen by the uh, gamma camera. So one in 5,000 sounds like a small value, but of course this, this is about atom disintegration. So if 5,000 atoms decay, then one of them will be seen, which actually means that the gamma camera has a very spectacular uh, sensitivity, and that allows it to see nanomole or even picomole concentrations, depending on how well uh, on specific specific activity of that. Another way to quickly see that the fluid half maximum increases linearly with the distance is this little drawing here. So if I would put the point source here, it would, for this particular part of the detector, irradiate half of the uh, detector and not the other half, because that would be in the shape. If I now move this point source to the left, then it's here, it will irradiate the, the uh, crystal between these two septa completely. And if I continue moving it, then it will be 50% again. So if I move it here, 50%, 100%, 50%. Now, the gamma camera is approximately shift invariant. So that means moving the point source from left to right is equivalent to moving the gamma camera from left to right or considering other parts of the gamma camera. So I could redraw this drawing by making the same drawing here. And then you could see that when, um, yeah, in, in both cases, you will find that this is the fluid half maximum of the um, 